coming up, the story of a rock record that we all owned. Um, in the 80s, you couldn't escape it if you tried. And it came from a rock band who more than paid their dues to make it. This record sold over 12 million copies in America alone on the strength of three massive hits. Uh, the number one hit that kicked it off was a rocker that grabbed you by the throat from the very first vocal. But it was originally a disco song that was written for a famous female singer. He basically took the music from the disco song and along with this band, wrote new lyrics over the top of it and made it a hardcore rock song. But once these rockers put their stamp on it, no one could fathom it being a, a disco pop song. Another of these hits was a masterpiece about the demons of fame. It was a, a warning sign of the backbreaking extremities of fame. And years after uh, the mega success of this record, it became so overwhelming to the front man, he was ready to end it all. So was this song a prophetic glimpse into the band's future? With the help of an iconic rock producer, we're gonna find out coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember night games as a kid, you know, playing those games like Kick the Can or Steal the Flag, you're gonna dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now, click the big red button so you know when our interviews drop. Uh, do that, so let's get into it. Today's album was owned by most of the people watching today. Uh, sold over 12 million copies in America, starting in 86, going into 87, with four big hits, including two that hit number one. Even if you didn't have the record, you heard it. But today we're gonna take a different look at these songs. So please open your mind and watch, even if you're not a fan of the band, because it's, it's quite a story. We're gonna cover two of the three big hits. Not the obvious one, which is easily one of the most popular songs ever recorded, as well as one of the most overplayed. <laughs> Instead, we're gonna focus on the first and third singles uh, on this record that are just as massive, but not as overplayed. We have a legendary producer to give us insight on this record since he's the one who engineered it. If you haven't figured out by now, I'm talking about Bon Jovi and their classic hits, Wanted Dead or Alive, and You Give Love a Bad Name, from their massive multi-platinum mega hit, Slippery When Wet. You know, it was a tireless work ethic Relentless ambition and uh, take no prisoners tenacity that propelled John Bon Jovi from sweeping floors in Jersey to fronting one of the highest grossing tour bands of all time. Bon Jovi would pay their dues to become global superstars and then pay some more as they fought to stay on top. So let's set it up real quick. John Francis Bon Jovi Jr. first met bandmate David Bryan at uh, Sayreville High School in New Jersey. They played in various local bands and then they moved to New York. Uh, to make some money and network with the music business. Uh, John actually got a job at his cousin Tony Bon Jovi's recording studio. It was called The Power Station. It's where John worked as a, a gopher, you know, sweeping floors, running errands, doing whatever. It was hard work, but it was a good move because after saving up some money and using his cousin's connections, John Bon Jovi hired some studio musicians to record a demo. And this demo was Runaway. So with a top 40 hit on his hands, John Bon Jovi assembled a band, recruiting friend and keyboardist David Bryan, guitarist Richie Sambora, bassist Alec John Such, and drummer Tico Torres. Then in July 1983, Bon Jovi released their self-titled debut. That one peaked at number 43 on the Billboard album chart. And then their next record, uh, 7800 Degrees Fahrenheit, edged a little further up the standings. It went to number 37. But his highest charting single, Only Lonely, that turned in a pedestrian number 54 ranking. So, you know, they were scrapping. You know, two failed albums and just a couple of modest hits to their name. It looked like Bon Jovi still had a long way to go to the top. Of course, their third album, Slippery When Wet, that would change everything in a hurry. But here's the thing. This was their make or break record. You know, in 1986, the band enlisted help to craft uh, this into a bestseller. That's where Desmond Child came in. Child would, of course, go on to jumpstart a litany of hits in the 80s for bands like Aerosmith and Joan Jett and the Blackhearts, Alice Cooper, to name a few. For Slippery When Wet, he would be credited as a co-writer on four tracks, including his two biggest singles, You Give Love a Bad Name and Living on a Prayer. Baby. 
And all the band put together something like 35 demos, which they then auditioned for teenage focus groups. Uh, the final track list was determined by the results there. Also added to the roster was iconic producer Bruce Fairbairn and his protege, engineer, and future iconic producer Bob Rock, who's here with us today. We're going to show you that in a second. The album was produced at Little Mountain Sound Studios in Vancouver, Canada in the spring of 86. Uh, Fairbairn and Rock worked with Bon Jovi for roughly uh, two months in pursuit of the perfect record. As intended, Slippery When Wet became Bon Jovi's breakthrough album. It was released on August 18, 1986, and it became the biggest selling rock album of 1987. It went diamond plus in the US, like I said, 12 million copies. Still Bon Jovi's biggest and most popular album, primarily on the back of three songs. The aforementioned You Give Love a Bad Name, Living on a Prayer, and Wanted Dead or Alive. So the remnants of You Give Love a Bad Name, that came from Desmond Child. This is very interesting. It started out as a disco song. Uh, it was recorded by Bonnie Tyler of Total Eclipse of the Heart fame. There's nothing I can do, a total eclipse of the heart. Interestingly enough, uh, it was Desmond Child who wrote Kiss's biggest hit, uh, the disco-esque I Was Made for Loving You. So there's that. Desmond Child, he went to his first meeting with John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora at uh, Richie's parents' home in New Jersey. They wrote in, in the basement, actually, of his mom's house. In that first session, You Give Love a Bad Name was born. Uh, the chemistry was just brilliant between these guys, as evidenced by Living on a Prayer and, and You Give Love a Bad Name. You Give Love a Bad Name was about being infatuated with a toxic lover. And uh, like I mentioned, it was a reworking of a disco song that Desmond had written for Bonnie Tyler. Uh, it was called, If You Were a Woman and I Was a Man. It didn't do well in America at all. It didn't even hit the top 50, but it was a huge hit in France. And when Desmond wrote it initially, he said that he felt it would be the biggest song ever. He would be dead wrong about the disco version, but you know, the rewritten rocker would be a gigantic number one hit and blow slippery when went out of the water. So let's get into what Bob Rock said about it. As we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsors, Any I wear the glasses I always wear. Go to our info button right up here and you can design your own pair of glasses. Color, the shape, the style. You know, they have so much variety for whatever your eyewear needs are. And they start at just $6.95. Quality's off the charts. Get yours today by clicking on this link. The intro is so important to that song, the opening vocal being so unique and 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 just grabbing you by the throat from the very instant. The heart, and you're too late, Tell me about that song, what your thoughts were as they were recording it and you're mixing it. Uh, for one, uh, uh, the intro was kind of interesting because the intro didn't have that guitar, the octave guitar in it, but Richie played played that at the end of the song. So I said, we should put that at the front for the hook, right? And so we did that. And Shot Through the Heart, they were talking about that. And that's, that's kind of a Desmond song. You can hear his formula all over that song, definitely. I remember they were talking about naming it Shot Through the Heart, but uh, it, it's really unique, even the outro, nailing that outro and and it's got such an energy to it. That's that great thing about live recording. I still do it. You know, there's the story you probably heard. It's like when I did Metallica, they had never recorded together in the studio. And I said, that's what, that's what I do. You got to do it. They were so mad at me. They were mad at me a lot. <laughs> but I said, that's how I make records. And then I explained to them why. I said... Yeah, it's pre-production. We get to work to find the right tempo, do all the changes, and then we record it. They got the lesson. Desmond Child has said that uh, John and Richie weren't aware that his song was a reworking of the Bonnie Tyler song. 
It's really cool that he wrote the same song twice and Bon Jovi took it to number one when they toned it up to be a rock song. So then there's Wanted Dead or Alive. In my opinion, the true masterwork of the Bon Jovi catalog. Immediately when you hear the title Wanted Dead or Alive, I mean, images of the Wild West come to mind. And the song's lyrics do draw on a Western setting with John declaring, I'm a cowboy on a steel horse I ride. On a steel horse I ride. But the imagery is about rock and roll, uh, symbolic of that anyway. Uh, it has a deeper meaning. This song's actually an autobiographical track about a rock star weary from touring. The Old West lyrics just reinforce the story. Despite the thrill of sold out arenas, uh, the mobs of adoring fans, the after hours parties and the superstar treatment, there's of course a very dark side to being out on tour. There's a real physical, mental and emotional toll that come with spending nearly every day on the road. Looking back on Bon Jovi's success, John would say, and I quote, you gotta remember all these gifts and opportunities came from so much work every single day. Life on the road, it's no vacation. Unfortunately, I don't get to see the world. What I see is hotel rooms, the gym, the restaurant, the bar, the airport, it's all the same. Only the name will change. It's a shame. I see very little because you don't really have days off. End of quote. Reportedly, John came up with the idea for Wanted Dead or Alive one morning after a sleepless night on the tour bus. You know, he and Richie would then hash it out in Sambora's mother's basement, like I said, where they wrote a lot of their songs. I guess it only took a day since the subject matter was just so true to life. It seems we're away. Additionally, Bon Jovi also drew inspiration for the track from Bob Seger's song, Turn the Page, which we've covered here before. Riding 16 hours and there's nothing much to do. Yeah, I read somewhere that John Bon Jovi was fighting a bad cold when he laid down the vocal for Wanted Dead or Alive. I think it actually enhanced the grittiness of the song. It's such a passionate vocal. When you think about uh, his vocals on this and you give Love a Bad Name and, you know, the key change at the end of Living on a Prayer, it's just mind-blowing, especially Living on a Prayer. I mean, he's such a perfect vocal. It's so high. He had to know there was no way he could replicate that over and over. Nobody could. I'll let Bob Rock tell you about that. As many of you know, Bob Rock produced Metallica's The Black Album as well as uh, quite a few albums after that for Metallica that followed. He produced and engineered many other classics from the likes of Aerosmith, The Motley Crue, and The Cult, and even Michael Bublé. This guy's very talented. Here he is. Tell me about that chemistry that you saw between John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambor and the band as they were getting that done. One thing that um, they did, um, actually, Richie uh, said that Bruce Reverend and I should do the next record because of the Honeymoon Suite record and other records we had done. You know, we he said these are the guys we're going to get. So, um, but they did pre-production. They had the song. They rehearsed them. You know, with Bruce. So all we had to do was record it and make it sound great. Now, these guys like Tico Torres, uh, incredible drummer. I mean, they're all great musicians. You know, they rehearsed it. They were hungry. They tore Vancouver apart, the whole city. They had so <laughs> much fun. And really, I think that shows in the, in the record. It was done very quickly. We kind of maybe three or four weeks recording everything and then mixing in a week, five weeks. Wow. But that's that, that's that magic that happens, right? What did you think when you first heard Wanted Dead or Alive? I know that that was inspired by, you know, Bob Seger's Turn the Page, yeah. obviously a road song. They lived it. And that's why when, when you hear him sing uh, about, uh, I've seen a million faces and I've rocked them all. Seen a million faces and I've rocked them all. That's just a phenomenal song. What was your take on it, the Old West theme and all? Well, let's, let's say this. So we, we uh, Bruce Fevern used to go home, well, he went home for dinner. So we did a pass. 
and dinner happened. It was okay. So we kind of knew what we were doing. So we went, so I took the band to a Greek restaurant and we drank, we drank. Okay. And we came back and we, we basically pressed play or record and the, the take after dinner with a bit of, what is it? Uzo, the Greek wine or whatever. And a great, uh, one take. And that was it. That's wow. how good they were. Yeah. Well, that 12 string guitar too. Well, that, that's a, that's an interesting, interesting thing. I'd never heard a guitar sound like that. A guild. I got one now. I bought one after that record. But the one thing on it was this new DDL that came out on AMS and it had a chorus feature on it. So that's the first time I used that. And I used that basically on lead vocals for my whole career. It's just this great unit. That song, it works so well because you can hear the experience in John's voice. You know, you could, you could just hear, hear the, uh, the, the sleepless nights and the being on the road. And that's what makes turn the page such a great, I, I read somewhere that he ran into Bob Seger and they had a little discussion about that. You know, uh, back then it, it was, I was starting to become awake of what a great band was and what great songwriters were like for instance they had raise your hands which is on the record right i said that's a, i said that's an okay song and he said no bob that's the opener of the show so they wrote a song for the opening of the show it was not supposed to be a hit right and i went that's so smart they were smart guys they're a great team a great team i still still i'm going to work with richie next week So released in 1987, uh, Wanted Dead or Alive was the third single from Slippery When Wed. It climbed to number seven on the Billboard Hot 100, and it went to number 13 on the Mainstream Rock Chart. Internationally, it went to number 20 in the Netherlands, number 17 in Canada, number 13 in the UK and Australia, number six in Ireland, and number five in New Zealand. You know, its music video perfectly complements the song's message. Directed by Wayne Isham and shot completely in black and white, the clip features footage from Bon Jovi's 86 to 87 tour, you know, showcasing the band's life on the road. It truly captures the euphoria and the fatigue of the rock and roll lifestyle, right? It's all in there. The performances, backstage, the dressing rooms, the tour buses, the road crew, the groupies. Crowds of crazy fans, you know, pressed up against barriers and windows, all vying for a piece of Bon Jovi. It really brings the reality of the song to light. And like I said, this is my favorite Bon Jovi song. Some very prominent musicians have actually said some rude things about this song, including uh, Les Claypool of Primus. I mentioned that just because I've read that before. And they're insane. This is a phenomenal rock song. Come to think of it, the producers of the 1990 film Young Guns 2 wanted to use this song. And John Bon Jovi was invited to the set in Santa Fe, New Mexico to check out the production. However, since Wanted Dead or Alive wasn't literally about cowboys, it was about rock stars, John didn't think it would fit the movie lyrically. So instead he penned a new song and played it for the execs on acoustic guitar right then and there, Blaze of Glory. So Wanted Dead or Alive and Living on a Prayer are also sometimes credited as the songs that kickstarted MTV's famed Unplugged series in the 1990s. Actually, at the 1989 MTV Video Music Awards, John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora strummed their way through acoustic versions of both of these songs. However, it's actually more myth than reality. According to the show's creators, Jim Burns and Bob Small, the series was already in production at that time. So if anything, Bon Jovi's acoustic performance was at best a validation that the concept could work very well. Who knows? Looking at this song with some hindsight, though, Wanted Dead or Alive, uh, it may be that uh, it was a warning of things to come. 
You know, the relentless touring schedule, that would take a heavy toll on the band. Actually, the Slippery When Wet tour began in July of 86 and ended in October of 87. It's about a year and a half long and totaled nearly 230 shows across North America, Europe, Australia, and Japan. Then in 1988, Bon Jovi was back in the studio recording their fourth album, New Jersey. That had to live up to all the hype as well, which it did. It went to number one and it sold seven million copies. Um, had a bunch of hits. Bon Jovi, of course, followed that up with another grueling tour. It was called the Jersey Syndicate. This one consisted of 238 shows across five continents from October of 88 to February of 90. It was even bigger than Slippery When Wet. It was massive. Completely burned out. Yeah, no one in the band had anything left to say to each other, and Bon Jovi went on hiatus for two years from there. Now, John actually moved to Malibu, California. From there, things just continued to get worse. His mental health was shot said John about it. I was at a crossroads. I'd achieved what I thought was it, and I was disappointed by it. I was like, is that it? Well, that sucks. The fame and fortune for him, it was all false promises. Anxious, lonely, and depressed, John continued to spiral downward from there. Broken down and completely spent and in a very dark frame of mind, John almost made a devastating and irreversible decision. Uh, while on his way to see a psychologist, uh, he was driving down California's Pacific Coast Highway. He was thinking about how sick he was of all of this. Not only the rock star lifestyle, but life itself, his life. In that moment, he seriously considered jumping out of the speeding car and ending everything. It's a moment he understandably doesn't like to talk about. He said, I'm not ready to share it in full, but it was not pretty. But the good news is that obviously he's still here. Whatever it was that changed his mind, he can be grateful, we can be grateful, that it was enough that uh, pulled him out of the tailspin. But man, it really adds a whole new dimension to the meaning of wanted dead or alive if you listen to it now. John says he never wants to go back to that place. After taking some time for a solo career, John then regrouped with the band for 92's Keep the Faith. Still rugged and road weary, at least now he was a little bit wiser. It turns out Bon Jovi tours would be much more manageable from then on out. Bottom line here is these two songs, along with Living on a Prayer, made Slippery When Wet one of the premier rock albums of all time. The album cover was also kind of controversial. Initially it had a stripper on the front cover, you know, showing cleavage with the title. The label was afraid some retailers would not sell it, so they replaced it with, get this, a big black garbage sack that said the album title across it instead of the cleavage. It's interesting. Uh, the trash bag actually sold 12 million copies in America and close to 20 million worldwide. It would spend 38 weeks in the top five alone and, like I said, the best-selling album of 87. So the lyric that every 80s kid knows by heart when John sings, I've seen a million faces and I've rocked them all, it's kind of an understatement, right? <laughs> Leave us a comment about Bon Jovi and Wanted Dead or Alive and You Give Love a Bad Name. What are your memories of this song, of this album? It was so massive. I remember jumping on the trampoline and, and doing karate and wrestling tournaments to it. It was just so big. Let us know below your, uh, your memories of it, your thoughts on the song. Let's have a great discussion. Uh, if you like our content, we'd love to have you subscribe. Check us out on Patreon for even more content. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. <laughs>